today we're talking about personality and its impact on health behaviours, or all sorts of behaviours. Personality is often not seen as a health issue because it says here it's a person's a, a, a personality is a person's pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting in all sorts of ways. Um, and if we look at health as a purely medical thing, then it's easy to dismiss personality as a factor that has an impact. But as you'll see, um, a person's personality can affect the way people think, the way they feel about things, and the way they behave in all sorts of ways. We'll get into that. Um, generally speaking, and probably uh, in popular culture, there's seen, seen, seen as having two types of personalities. This, uh, the study of personality is one of the oldest fields of um, study in psychology that there is. Uh, who's heard of a type A personality? No, nobody's heard of type A personality? Okay. Um, these are the sort of the, the go-ahead, ambitious, corporate types that feel everything has to be done in a hurry. Ten, ten, the, the, the stereotype ten, ten, tends to be the sort of high-achieving office worker type. Right. Easily angered. So their emotions are close to the surface. Competitive and ambitious. One of the things that comes up when we talk about personality is, the, oh, I know people like this. Because we, we do. We do. When person, descriptors for personality are the types of ways that we describe ourselves and other people. We don't describe ourselves generally as in relation to a health concern, but in relation to our personality type we do. Work hard and play hard. So these are the people that are into extreme sports, skydiving, rock climbing. Um, what, what, what's, what's that one with a, with a, with a para, para, parasailing? All that. Interestingly, more prone to heart disease than the rest of the population. Possibly because of some of these things. Which is not a good thing. But you take the rough with the smooth, right? Then you have the type B personalities. And you'll see as we go through that this is really quite a, a crude distinction between type A and type B. We can, we can unpack it and chop up the onion uh, in, in a lot of different ways. Type Bs tend to be more relaxed and easygoing, the sort of way you like to think about yourself. Um, Maybe not the way other people think about you. you know. So I feed up on the desk all the time in the world. Just chilling. Some people don't, go, don't fit neatly into either type, which as I say, this is, this is a crude distinction. So, you can take it a little bit further and say, maybe there's four types glass half full or glass half empty types? I don't know. Or the indecisive ones? Or something like that? Psychoanalysis had a lot to say about personality and you'll be familiar with a lot of this. So a personality, you've seen this picture before, is like an iceberg where you have your consciousness, which is things that you are aware of, our known knowns, if you like. A pre-conscious, things that we can be aware of if we think of them. But we're not always aware of them, but when we get reflective, do you like that word? We well, hate that word. <laughs> You like 
you become aware of them. When you tell yourself a story, you think, oh, I never realized that about myself before. And then the, there's the unconscious, which is your deep unconscious reservoir that holds the true us. Or does it? Somebody else has said, uh, you are what you think about, which tends to counteract this. But I think it, it is fair to say that a lot of our desires and fears are sunken or submerged or hidden in one way or another. It's not quite what being, what, um, being unconscious means. And I won't ask for a volunteer. I don't have a baseball bat. So the concept is we have the ego, the super ego and the id. The ego is the conscious part. You know the way you, the way you feel in yourself, what's important to you, what you believe. Your super ego is what in that last assignment you were asked to look into and as I say, tell a bit of a story about what does that mean about you? Okay, what, what, do, what do these descriptors about you um, th that, are in, that are in your conscious awareness, when you look beneath the surface, what are the implications of that? And then the id or um, what's otherwise known as the life force is what's underpinning all that. What's your drive? And these are things that you may need somebody else to point them out to you. There may be things that you can't actually put into words. Who's heard of the id before? Who's heard of an idiot? That's where the word comes from. The word idiot is basically talking about somebody who is not aware of what he's doing. Or she. So the id impulses that we have are entirely unconscious to us. They're not something that we have conscious awareness of. They're what we actually, at a, at a deep biological level, want and desire. And Freud's been criticised a lot for, um, for reducing human impulses to, um, to an animal biological level. Um, Like, like cavemen. And I think there's, there's some validity in, in some of that criticism. Basically, the id works on the pleasure principle. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, I feel aversion towards it. Okay? If I like doing something, I'm likely to do more of it. And you can see in some conditions, and I'm thinking particularly around addictions, how... Um, how the pleasure principle operates, we have a reward circuit in our brain that gets activated when we, ex we, we have a pleasurable experience. The flip side of the pleasure principle is the avoidance of pain and the reception of instant gratification. The id is very bad at delaying gratification. So whenever you're telling yourself, wait, this is not the right time, words to that effect, then it is not your id speaking to you. It's your super ego, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, here's an example of the id at work. 
I like the spaghetti in my plate or whatever's in that plate or the Cocoa Pops or, or whatever it is. So I'm not really giving it a lot of thought. I just like it. And I end up in a mess. This happens to two-year-olds, doesn't it? The ego develops after the end. After you develop some self-awareness and some sense of where you fit in the world, it works on the reality principle. That is that this is what I would like. This is what will give me pleasure or help me avoid pain. But this is the reality of the situation. I have to study. I have to hand that assignment in. Um, I have to get up on a rainy morning. Rather not. Who'd rather not be here today, <laughs> given the morning, the weather, the way the weather was this morning? It's a um, I was I was thinking of, on the way down, sort of driving through floodwaters. Shouldn't be doing this, really. But anyway. So there's there's a negotiation that goes on between our pleasure principle, between our id, and the reality of the environment, that we're in, the situation. That we're in. So. He knows what he would like to do, but he also knows that he'd get into big trouble. Working with cavemen again, big criticism. Um, this is somebody who is thinking, yeah, I really shouldn't have gone there because I knew this would happen. And here's somebody who, if you like, did the right thing negotiated successfully. Okay. And I'm sure you've all been embarrassed around people, maybe not directly, but noticed interactions between people that were very awkward and embarrassing to observe. Now, this happens consciously and unconsciously. This, this, um, this negotiation, because obviously the id is unconscious, the ego is conscious. And the outcome of that negotiation is what people see in the, at the visible level. If, if you remember that iceberg picture. you see in the mirror. Ooh. All right, the superego, otherwise known as the conscience, or sometimes known as the conscience, develops at about the age of five, where you start to develop a sense of right and wrong. And it's the mediator between the id and the, and the ego. So about the age of five, rules start to become very important to kids and continue to be very important all the way through primary school and some way into in secondary school, but then we sort of move on from there. So you have your imaginary friend that's helping you work out what to do next. Talked about that. Talked about the mediation that goes on. And you've seen this picture in popular culture or similar ones to it, where you've got the two voices. So do it, don't do it. Okay. This is all Freudian. And um, one, of, one of the... Um, one of the things that people are aware of is how influential Freudian thought still is in popular culture. So to defense mechanisms, which are the ways that the mediation plays out in a psychoanalytic frame. So we'll give you a scenario in a minute. What you're essentially wanting to do in 
stressful situations is to protect yourself from threat. And the threat is generally an unconscious thing. Okay. Here's the scenario. Brandon is the captain of the high school football team. He's Dave and Jasmine. That's Brandon. That's Jasmine. Brandon dumps Jasmine. No, other way. Jasmine jumps Brandon and starts dating Drew, president of the chess club. So this is a very realistic situation. Happens every day. Here are some ways that Brandon can react to that situation. Repression is a defense mechanism that pushes thoughts into our unconscious. So we're repressing things, we're, we're pushing things down. Who's heard of the term repression? Okay, so the example is Brandon saying, who? Haven't thought about it. Just burying any, any thoughts that he'd, that he'd had or any, any sense that, that anything happened that he cared about. Because admitting to himself what has happened is something that he doesn't want to do with. Otherwise known as the elephant in the room. Denial. Who's seen Finding Nemo? Not accepting an ego-threatening truth. This is often an ex explanation for people dealing with anxiety. Sort of holding things, holding things at arm's length. Just behaving as if nothing's changed. Okay, so still hanging out, still planning dates. Um, maybe if you have a conversation, sort of, you know, you're not going out anymore. Yeah, I know, I know. But you're behaving as if nothing's changed. And again, I'm sure you know people who have represented these types of behaviour in different situations at some point. You give it, all, give it enough thought. These don't help, by the way. These first few mechanisms don't actually help with the anxiety or to protect yourself in any effective way. Displacement, this is an interesting one. Redirecting one's feelings towards another person or object. Taking out an anger on another kid by bullying coming home and kicking the cat or going to your room and slamming the door, not talking to anybody. Nobody's ever done that, have they? Projection. Believing that the feelings one has towards someone else are actually held by the other person and directed at oneself. Sounds complicated. Similar to denial in a way. But there are no signs that Jasmine still cares for him, despite what he's saying. And then reaction formation which is the opposite. So you're forming a reaction to, this, to the situation. So you're going to the opposite extreme. Maybe getting into fights with somebody that you really want to make up with. People do this. And regression. Coming childlike.
and we know people, I'm sure you know people even into well into adolescence who have held on to things like security blankets or soft toys that they relied on when, when they were when they were children. And you, from a psychoanalytic perspective, there, there's quite quite a strong indication in those type of situations that there's something unresolved, there's some unresolved anxiety going on that's leading to that behaviour. I knew a girl um, who, until she was about 20, had a blanket, like you know, a security blanket. And all that was left of this blanket was smaller than the size of a handkerchief. But it had to go with her everywhere. She was probably about 19 before she got back. But there were some deep-seated issues uh, and things that had happened to her that, um, that were quite traumatising. So, yeah. Okay, so they're the, if you like, um, less helpful ones. Rationalisation can be good, can be not sometimes. Um, does get criticised, but this is probably one that's less damaging. You're looking for a beneficial result. Um, the rationalising is probably not great. So saying things like, you know, I really didn't want to, and you know, it was too much. We were spending too much time together. Blah, blah, blah. Making excuses. Intellectualization. Just trying to take all the emotion out of it. And you, and you see this with people that um, get bound up in their work as a way of escaping from other things going on in their lives, where they'll really immerse themselves in, um, in, in, what, in what they're doing that is not emotionally threatening. So for example, a research paper on failed teenage romances. Um, I'm sure the internet's full, or social media is full of that sort of stuff. People writing their, their, their PhD as a, as a form of self therapy. Sublimation, probably a more helpful way through. Channeling one's frustration towards a different goal. Taking, taking on music or going to the gym, say. And you'll see this with people who have, you know, achieved big things. That sometimes they've had a massive setback earlier on, and the way that they coped with that setback was by setting up this new project. A classic example of that is Steve Jobs. Got fired from the company that he founded, went on to set up Pixar and Next, and Apple bought Next, and went back to Apple as a CEO. Um, and that's not something that happens very often, that, that exact scenario, but the energy involved is not a problem. Okay, and you can see how a lot of these relate to a person's behavior in relation to their health. The people can repress thoughts about about their health. They can be in denial. They can intellectualise, they can rationalise, they can do all of these things. Now, some criticisms of Freud um, and really why he, he doesn't stack up uh, as, as a scientific study, certainly as, a, as a, an example of popular culture, um, or I suppose what's called these days fake news. Um, his study 
sample was not representative. Wealthy women in Austria should be women. So no men, no kids, no elderly people, quite a narrow age range. Freud's results have been described as tautological, that you can't come up with a null hypothesis. You haven't done EBP yet, have you? Evidence-based practice or research methods. Okay, when, when you talk about, uh, I think it's in second year, um, when you talk about writing a hypothesis, you've got to have a way of disproving your hypothesis. Okay, and if you fail to prove the null hypothesis, then what you believe is actually the case. Okay, that's scientific method. Um, um, Freud's been criticised repeatedly for, for not following the scientific method um, and being very difficult to disprove. And, and the idea of an argument being tautological is that it basically goes around and around in circles. That if you if you if you come up with data that seems to disprove the hypothesis, then there's an explanation within the theory that, dis, that disproves your disproving. Does that make sense? It's also looking backwards. There's no um, power in Freud's theories of personality to predict how somebody might react in the future. Despite the fact that there's been lots of attempts to, um, to ascribe future behavior based on a person's past behavior, you can't actually do that with any, deg with any degree of reliability. It's been described as sexist. saying that what, what he described as penis envy was actually wound envy because he was working with women. Yeah. Nevertheless, a lot of neo-Freudians, uh, followers of Freud's ideas have come up with a number of um, developments. Ericsson, you've heard about um, Andre, mentioned Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. Jung's talked about personal and collective unconsciousness, so the idea of a cultural unconscious and, uh, and, and uh, cultural archetypes. Adler, who talked about superior, superiority and inferiority and also talked about um, the importance of birth order. So studies around being a middle child or an eldest child or a youngest child. Who, who's a middle child? Okay. And you've heard all that stuff. Yeah, that's from Adler. That's a Freudian theory as well. And there's been a lot of study done around what impact on personality birth order has. And yeah, we'll keep you here for a while. Okay, moving on. Psychoanalytic theory is what's called a structural theory of personality. That's on the one side. The other main type of theory of personality are what's called trait theories, or tray theories, if you want to be correcting the pronunciation. And what a, what a trait theory talks about is the belief that we can describe people's personality by delineating their, their defining characteristics or their traits. And some of these, will, again, will be familiar to you. Um, typos. Honesty, 
You describe yourself as an honest person. Lazy. It was in, it's interesting in the first assignment how often laziness comes up. I don't know why that is. Um, ambitious, outgoing. Now, the important thing around, around trait theories um, in relation to personality is that they're thought to be stable across the course of a person's lifespan. So if you're honest, or if you're lazy, or if you're ambitious, or if you're outgoing, um, then these are inbuilt things that don't change. Now, never mind if you don't agree with that. That's just what the theories are, talk are talking about. Um, again, there's been a lot of study done recently to say that you can learn. You, know, you might be hard working and you, and you have to work hard to learn how to be lazy. It's a goal to point. You too can do like this. Or you could be like Abraham Lincoln. I'm glad Beard's off that in my profession. Okay. A nomothetic theory is a theory where the same traits, traits can be used to describe all people's personalities. An example is the ex introversion ext extroversion scale, which I'm sure you've heard of. People know what an introvert is and what an extrovert is, or you think you do. Could be wrong. So you've got a, you get a sense from just what the person looks like, what type of person they might be. How long does it take to make a first impression? About 10 seconds. Really good. I'm not familiar with the Jersey Shore, you guys might be. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have time to um, sort of yeah if, if think yeah you know what I'll, I'll I'll use one that that I'm more familiar with. So the the best known of these is what's called the Big Five personality traits: extroversion, agreeableness, and these are on scales. These are on continuums. Conscientiousness, openness to experience, and emotional stability. So if you look at each of these, so extroversion, what's the opposite of extroversion? Introversion. Agreeableness, crabbiness, not agreeableness, a degree of agreeableness. Conscientiousness, not so conscientious, greater or lesser. Open or not to experience, so open or closed. And emotional stability versus emotional instability. Okay, so mapping a person's personality on each of those five axes, if you like, and getting a sense of what sort of traits they have that make up who they are, how they behave. And there's some statistical analysis that's, um, I mean, fans of the Big Five in particular um, get themselves tied up in statistical knots trying to see the clusters and score the tests and make sense of who are you really. To, what, to which I would counter, well, does it really matter? What difference does it make? Okay, there's some ideographic theorists. 
who would argue that using the same set of trays to classify everyone is impossible. Each person may have a few trays that are unique to them. And there are a couple of examples coming up. There's an old photo of somebody who's more familiar now. And I'm not sure whether she's changed all that much over the last few years. I haven't actually seen any photos of her lately. People know who they are. Yeah. Um, So there are things that make all of us unique. There are things about, things about me that apply to nobody else. There are things about you that apply to, no, that, to nobody else. Um, not least your experience. You know, nobody has had exactly the same experience as, as you. And, like, and as, a, as, a, as I've said a number of times, Nobody, nobody is ever inside another person's experience and seeing the world completely through the other person's eyes. It's not possible. So some criticisms of trait theory. There's a tendency not to take into account the importance of the situation that a person is in. Sometimes it's important to dis more important to display a particular trait than its opposite in a given situation. And the, and the same person may, from a personality perspective, look quite different in two different situations. Oh, logical theories. What percentage of personality is inherited? We've talked about, um, oh, gone. Epigenetics. Uh, earlier on. The effect of the environment on gene expression. But there's been a lot of debate about the, the, the degree to which personality can be an inherited characteristic and stereotypes about particular genetic uh, ethnic groups, say, being you know, more expressive of particular um, personality types. This, uh, this week, you, we're in the, um, the labs and the sim, um, you're working on um, cultural and linguistic diversity. And there's a lot of stereotypes about, say, for example, the way people grieve from a given culture. And if you've got somebody from a given culture grieving in a different way, it doesn't look right. If you expect them to behave in a, in, in, in a way that they're not behaving. The interesting thing is we do know, or we do seem to um, have data suggesting that temperaments seem to be stable. Have you heard of the marshmallow test? No? They did a test with four-year-olds, I think it was might have been three-year-olds, where they put them in a room by themselves with nothing else in the room except the marshmallow on the table. And they said to the three-year-old, you can have the marshmallow now, but if you wait for five minutes until I come back and you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you another marshmallow. This is an exercise in uh, delayed gratification. Re and they video what the kids did. There's a TED talk on it. It's fantastic. Um, what they've found is that the kids who managed to resist the temptation to eat the marshmallow did better in life. So delayed gratification is positively correlated with good outcomes in all sorts of ways, from a health point of view, from a career point of view, financially, relationally, 
in all sorts of ways. Um, and most of the kids were just like you would, just like you would expect, either maybe lasting five seconds or doing everything they could to get as close as they possibly could to the marshmallow to the point where one kid was sort of sniffing it, it was almost up her nose, but she hadn't eaten it. They're very cute. And the idea that temperament is stable uh, is probably stronger than arguments for personality being stable over time. pictures. So a kid like this may more likely grow up to be an adult like this and a kid like this probably still not have teeth when they're older. Somatotypes. You would have heard of this one as well. It's a biological theory by a guy called William Sheldon. Endomorphs. Again, working on stereotypes, tend to be friendly and outgoing people, although not always. I'm sure you can think of it. I'm sure you can think of people who are not, who don't, don't fit that image. Muscular types tend to be more aggressive, but there's biological basis for, um, for these ideas. And then ectomorphs, tend to be shy, secretive types. Very, very, very stereotypical. Um, but again, quite influential in the way that we think and unconsciously react to people around us and expect people around us to behave. So from a healthcare perspective, would you expect somebody like this to take care of their physical health? Yes. Would you expect somebody like this to take care of their physical health? Would you be surprised if the opposite was true? Yes, we probably would. And you might be surprised. Because it's not necessarily the case. As we, said, as we saw earlier, um, people like this tend to have much more heart, heart disease because of the stress in their lives. One example. Behaviour theories. What we think about personality is meaningless. What makes a difference is actually what we do. And personality changes according to what reinforces are in the environment or if you like, what negative reinforcements or punishments we get. So for example, you score a goal, you have a win, You're going to do more of what you were doing. You get white line fever. You go into a different environment. You're going to change who you are. Um, and again, as I've, as I've said here before, you see this in peak hour traffic all the time. Particularly in the afternoon. I don't know what that, well, I do know what that's about. It's fever Okay, so again, two, per, two, um, two situations, same person. Um, I think that's the Dancing with the Stars thing. Humanistic theories. One of the criticisms and one of the features of, um, of psychoanalytic theory is the idea of determinism, that everything has a reason and that what, what happens now has been predetermined by what happened in the past to you.
the humanist idea believes much more in the idea of free will and the um, a characterization that I heard of about that a while ago was essentially saying that the person's past is not the future. And I find that quite helpful from a, from a healthcare perspective to say that, okay, this may have been your past, but we can draw a line under that. And what's, what's happened years ago doesn't have to be still affecting you now. can bring us into conflict. And to be fair, people around us are often um, quite threatened by, an, by any idea or any indication that, that we're changing in ways that they don't understand. I don't know if this is resonating with anybody. But you see it from time to time that somebody will make a decision about the direction of their lives that the rest of their family does not understand. One of the bases of humanistic theories is that people are innately good. Whatever that, whatever good means. And as long as our self-esteem, and it's interesting, there's a book a little while ago called, uh, written called The Myth of Self-Esteem. We won't go there. Um, and self-concept are positive. then we will be happy. So as long as we're comfortable with who we are, then our outcomes will be good. So it doesn't matter what our traits are, what our types are, what our, what our morphs are. If, we're, if we have good self-esteem and good self-concept, then we'll do okay. One of the primary proponents of humanistic theories was a guy called Carl Rogers. He was a therapist. And he posed the question, what do acorns need to grow? Given that the object, guess who else was a, was a humanist? That's nice this idea of, being, of becoming self-actualized. So acorns need, what do they need? What do acorns need to grow? They need drink, water, sun. So you need the right sort of environment. Water, sun, and soil. Except as humans, we also need a few different things. We need to be treated genuinely, honestly. We need to be accepted for who we are. And Rogers coined the term of unconditional positive regard which can be a difficult thing to achieve. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second here. Empathy you've come across. Again, not an, easy, not an easy concept to get your head around necessarily. So if you like human acorns, in addition to the right environment, need these other elements in their lives in order to thrive. And that's been, that's been built on and developed over the years um, into, into quite a body of work, actually. 
Social cognitive theories are about the interactions that we have with our culture and with our environment. Ideas of social learning. Somebody, somebody mentioned in their, um, in their assignment, I can't remember who it was now. Who's heard of Albert Bandura? Yeah, yeah, what have, what have you heard about him? Could have been. That 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 doesn't that doesn't ring a specific bell for me. But but the idea of learning by observation, yeah, you learn by observing what others do. The, the sort of if you like the monkey see monkey do, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you mo you model the behaviour of others who seem to be doing it right, and um, yeah, yeah. So there's an interaction between the person's cognitive or thinking, the affective or mood states and their biological, what's going on for them, what's happening in the environment and behaviour. And there's, there, there's an interreliability almost between those three, three aspects of, of, uh, of determinants of, of, um, of a person's outcomes. There's a thing called reciprocal determinism. So things affect other things, but it's not just the past affecting the, pre the present. It's traits, environment and behaviour, all interacting and influencing each other. Okay, you see how complicated this gets? Okay. And in the social cognitive space, this is where you get, get ideas about internal and external locus of control. Who's in charge? Am I in charge of my own destiny or are, are other people controlling what happens to me? Um, that's why people get so nervous when the Reserve Bank puts up interest rates, for example, or the price of petrol. Um, who shops around for petrol? Who's, who's, who's responsible for what happens to you? Is it a matter of your own choices? And you can make a difference to how you turn out? Or do you feel helpless in the, in the face of what's going on around you and things bigger than you can control? We were talking earlier about um, your project coming up on, on uh, looking at a determinant of health, one of the World Health Organization determinants. And a lot of those are bigger than any one person can affect. And that's why they have to be in the, in the uh, in the area of, of health promotion to make a difference because we're dealing with a population here. And we're maybe, maybe, maybe mobilizing some energy that otherwise wouldn't be. And getting away from this sense of learned helplessness that people can become prone to when you know, you're seeing things day to day and your life is what your life is and you know, you're doing the best you can. It's just not working out. And you feel, you, know, you, you can feel passive in the face of that. That things are happening to me, things have happened to me that I've had no control over but have massively influenced what my life is like. And people have managed to, if you like, 
overcome. I mean, this guy could have been this guy 20 years ago. We don't know. This guy could have been this guy 20 years ago. We don't know that either. And we don't know what's happened in between. Can you see that? So what you see in the waiting room or in the office um, right in front of you is a, is a really tiny snapshot of who the person is. And we need to go broader than that. And sometimes we need to go broader than the person has, e has even thought about going themselves. Sometimes we're like the experiment that was done um, where they had a dog who was shocked on that side of the box. So it found itself on that side of the box more often than not. And they found that they could control the dog's behavior and that eventually it would go into that side of the box even when there was no shock over here. Even when there was food on this side of the box, it would stay over here. When it wasn't, because it, he'd learned to avoid the shock. And could end up in a, an ideal health state. Because of what, they'd, what he'd learned about, or what she'd learned about. their environment, the way they thought about the environment and the behaviour that resulted. Okay, so to assess personality, a couple of um, major ways that, um, that are used to assess personality. The most common way is one of a number of self-report inventories, and you may have done some of these. You probably haven't done this one. This is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory or the MMPI. Um, and the reason you wouldn't have done it is that it takes ages. And it's boring as all get out. It's, it's, a, it's a series of questions, um, yes, no questions that come up with an overall score. You would have done similar types of things much shorter but the reason the MMPI is used for for assessing personality in, in clinical settings is that they're found that it is reliable it, it yields the same results over time so the same person doing the result do, doing the test will come up with the same score and, it's, and it does seem to measure what it's supposed to measure. The other one that you may have heard, Mike, who's heard about, who's heard of the Myers-Briggs? You, you've heard of the Myers-Briggs? Yeah, do you know your numbers? Or your letters? Huh? I-N-T-J. Now there's four letters. We'll come to it. Okay, you can be an E or an I. Where have, we, where have we seen these sort of things? This is, this is like your, your, your five types, isn't it? Your big five. You can be sensing or intuitive. You can be thinking or feeling. Or, and you can be judging and perceiving. So there's four times four. You, there's 16 types within the Myers-Briggs nomenclature. That you can find yourself as and there's been all sorts of work done around typical careers that people move into based on personality types um, this is used a lot in corporate some of you may be familiar with Dilbert now the issue is that a lot of these personality types um, as I've been saying all the way through, are open to stereotyping. 
and to misinterpret. So a quiet, dumb guy doesn't necessarily pair well with an extroverted thinker. Um, and what are those what do those terms mean anyway? Now, just to explode some myths. Extrovert does not mean talkative or loud. Introvert does not mean that you are shy or inhibited. There was a book a couple of years ago called Quiet uh, about the power of introversion. If you're interested in this, I've got a copy. I'm uh, happy to uh, let you read it. Um, feeling is not about being emotional. Judging is not about being judgmental and perceiving is not about being perceptive. These are, with apologies to the last one, common misconceptions that people have about these very common terms. Who's not heard of one of those terms? Everybody's heard of these descriptors for people's personality types. The distinction between, or the, the line between extrovert and introvert is about how you get and use your energy. Now notice with this, this is not about continuum. This is either or. So if you're slightly one way or the other, then that's the camp you're in. It's not, I'm slightly this way or I'm slightly that way. Um, you have to choose one or the other. And the Myers-Briggs questions are yes, no questions. If you can't decide, you just have to pick one. So here are some characteristics that typify somebody on the east side. So they get, your, get and use energy from the external world. So according to Myers-Briggs, I'm an extrovert, which I always think is weird. Um, but the biggest indicator for that is that I solve problems by talking to people. I don't solve problems nearly so well in the space of my own head. Drives my wife crazy. Because sometimes I just need to talk and she doesn't need to do anything except listen. Sometimes she doesn't even need to listen. She just needs to be there. And I'll just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And come to a resolution that makes sense to me. Anybody else do that? Do you compare to admit? Yeah. So if you, once again, get your energy and use your energy from the external world, and you need the external world around you to do that, then you're an extrovert. It's not about being the life of the party. I'm anything but the life of the party. Whereas an introvert gets their energy and uses the energy from their own internal world. So if you like, another word for introvert might be self-reliant. They don't need other people around to get on with things. Uh, and there's some of the characteristics for that. I need to move on. I'm sure you want to break before before John. The sensing an intuitive pair, how you take in information. Do you take it in through your senses or do you take information in intuitively? Somebody who is taking in information through your senses is much more focused on the real and the now, the tangible stuff. Where somebody who's more intuitive is more on about possibilities, 
more future oriented. It's much more comfortable with uncertainty. And without doing the test, you can actually do the, the, the Myers-Briggs online. You, um, I, think, I think I've even got a, a link on Brightspace. Is it, is it still there? Yeah? Um, have a look at it, it's a bit of fun. It's not the be all and end all, but you know. Thinking and feeling is about how you make decisions. So do you make decisions using logic? Or do you make decisions through emotion? And the last one, how do you organize your life? Do you use your judgment or do you use your perception to organize your life? So are you planned and orderly and concerned with closure in the way you want to get things organized? Or is it important to you to be flexible and spontaneous and stay open to new possibilities? Now notice that with each of these four pairs, none is necessarily, or sorry, neither is necessarily better or worse than, than the other. It is different. And they're all needed, they're all necessary. They're all valuable in their own ways. So here are the, here are the numbers. I don't know if, how, you, how you've gone in, in your own quick little self-judgments. But are you introvert, extrovert? Are you, uh, what was the end of the SRN. Um, this is why I can never do these things. I can never remember what the damn things are. <laughs> But you come up with a, 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 a selection of four letters and some people will say, oh yeah, I'm an INTJ. And they can remember what that means. Okay. And, pe and people who are in the know have sort of, oh yeah, you don't want to be one of those. Okay. People have bad names. If you're an extrovert, You got to be aware that style can be overwhelming for people that on, on the other side of that that divide, and you need to be aware that some people, maybe not you, need things written down. If you're an introvert, you may be aware of a need to be more assertive you may need to work at letting people know where you are, what you're up to, what your needs are, because you may not express that. You may need to ask for more time than people are naturally prepared to give you. And you may need to recognise the fact that people naturally need face-to-face -face time. because you're quite comfortable by yourself. And sometimes you might be more comfortable um, by yourself than somebody else who needs to be, need, needs to have some time with you. Okay. As a sensor, if you've got lots of helpful questions and useful details, you may cut off other people. You may not be somebody who naturally asks people for their ideas and you might need to deliberately allow time for brainstorming.
if you're an intuitive, this is where I got confused. So that's actually I, my A. Some of your intuitions may not be necessarily terribly reality based. Intuitives are often very good ideas, people, um, but sometimes not very good finishes, if you like. If you're a thinker, there's a couple of tips about the need to develop personal connections. And your idea of a liveliness of a difference of opinion may represent conflict to other people. There may be tension in the relationship as a result. So you can see how for each of these types, modulating what you do and developing some self-awareness about how you play out, how you sit, how you seem to other people around you. Um, can help you move move through life you know, with, less, with less scathing. Okay, judging types may not recognize that structure is restrictive to some people. That there may be time needed to make decisions. That other people need to be held responsible rather than having a top-down process. That can be tricky in healthcare sometimes. Follow the, follow the procedure. Ooh. What if there's no time? What if it's an emergency? Asking tones rather than insisting tones. <laughs> and the last one. If you're a perceiver, the exploration that, that you do seems to take a lot of time. And people get impatient with you. Maybe you need to set deadlines or quarantine some time to get through so that you can follow through on the commitments. And lastly, be careful of the Barnum effect because when we're looking at personality, we do have a tendency to describe ourselves in vague stock standard ways that leave ourselves wide open to things that we think, oh yeah, that's me. Because it's vague enough that it's, it doesn't not apply to anybody. But again, it's a total fallacy that people can, uh, people can fall into very easily. So personality is one of those um, aspects of determinants of of health behaviour that sometimes are, are more deterministic than others, but there's all sorts of ways of, uh, of making sense of it. Um, once again, there's, there's a lot of content being thrown at you um, because there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, but uh, in, the, uh, in the rest of this week, we'll be looking a little bit more at, um, at culture different ways of thinking about culture, different ways of understanding where people are coming from. So we'll see you in the tubes.